Good afternoon and welcome then to what is going to be the last class in this series, which is uh, popular culture in Britain since 1945. And this is the, the third class on, on popular music. Now, of course, the difficulty with popular music is we're talking about thousands or tens of thousands or perhaps even hundreds of thousands of songs. And so it's very difficult to say things which are very general. So what we've been doing if we've been concentrating on uh, genres, uh, musical genres, and I want today to give you a few examples of musical genres from the 1970s. Uh, and the reason is not just because I like the 1970s, although I do like the 1970s, but to show a little bit about how um, genres work, a little bit more about how genres work, um, how they uh, can transmit certain values, uh, how they have certain priorities, how they have certain favorite mass activities, uh, and so on and so forth. And so I'm going to begin with this one, uh, as I, I uh, spoke to you last week about rock and roll. Uh, there's a progressive rock, progressive rock. Now, the, the idea of the, 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 this, uh, this uh, genre, progressive rock, uh, it's not, the, not, we're not talking about uh, being progressive politically, uh, being in favor of uh, women's liberation and, uh, and um, uh, 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 democratic rights and so on, uh, but uh, it, it this is the 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 term that came to that came to uh, to describe it. So, uh, what e what are the priorities of uh, progressive rock? Well, first of all, the most no doubt the most uh, um, well known uh, um, people who would who would count as progressive rock are people like Pink Floyd, people like Led Zeppelin. Uh, and, and, and yes, and Genesis and people like that. These are the people that we're talking about. And you can't necessarily, you can't necessarily hope uh, all, uh, all uh, the music to be similar. Best extract there, but that, that's from uh, uh, Pink Floyd's uh, "Wish You Were Here." Uh, and some of the priorities we see in there: first of all, virtuosity. That is, that it's important to show how good you are with your instruments. And so we will expect longer pieces of music, not the three-minute pop song. No, this is the uh, the twelve-minute pop song. I remember one of uh, uh, Edgar Broughton, the Edgar Broughton band's uh, uh, tracks, which I think is like eighteen minutes long, and so on. Um, the themes, again, the themes is not, you know, let's party on a Saturday night and aren't we very good at picking up girls, the classic rock and roll theme, much more philosophical theme. So this this uh, this one, Wish You Were Here, is, you know, uh, it's all, all about the uh, <coughs> the meaning of life, it, <coughs> of life, if you like, and famously <coughs> Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven is some sort of reflection on uh, <coughs> the self uh, within a commercial society. Uh, the stage performance is very different from rock and roll, very different from uh, whether it be uh, um, Elvis Presley or, or other uh, rock idols. Uh, there is a distance from the sexualization of, uh, of onstage performance, is that the, the, the classic singer from progressive rock is supposed to be concentrating on feeling what is coming from his soul uh, and not in, uh, in uh, uh, directly liaising with the audience. Uh, it's often been re re uh, noted that there's a link to high culture or high art uh, that, that is both from the point of view of the music, a certain number of the uh, progressive rock uh, stars uh, began uh, uh, as trained musicians, trained in classical music, uh, and also the album covers, remember this is the time of the LP, so it's quite, quite, a big, it's quite a big space you have to do art on. The album covers were famously um, considered as works of art, and indeed you can find on the, on, on the, uh, on the web a galleries where that's that's the center of it uh, very much uh, dreamy dreamy uh, themes um, um, often said to be connected to taking of certain ha hallucinogenic drugs the stage shows were very elaborate and the albums because the center of progressive rock was not the single the three minutes but the album the 38 minute or or 40 minute uh, piece 
And one of the specialities of uh, Progressive what was to produce what they called concept albums. And a concept album is the idea that an album uh, with 12, traditionally with 12 songs, uh, is not just a collection of songs. It has a unity and it's a piece of art in itself. So it might be linked together by a theme or it might be linked together, uh, uh, it might be a story uh, or, 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 or something like that. And the, and the final question, which is always good uh, with, uh, with any uh, genre of popular music in the last 50 years, uh, what is it rebelling against? And that's because, uh, because uh, since um, Skiffle at least, uh, uh, genre music, new musical genres has been connected to to being young and rejecting some of the the favourite ways of expressing themselves of the previous generation or even of the generation of a few years earlier. Certainly, progressive progressive what rock was um, protesting against the three minute pop song, the superficial perhaps commercial perhaps three minute love song about dancing on a Saturday night. Um, and uh, claiming to be more in contact with a wider view, a sort of new age view, and there's a certain link with uh, um, uh, ideology of, of people who, who are often referred to as hippies, although that's a very complicated uh, uh, word. So that, that's the sort of thing you're getting from uh, progressive rock. And you can see here then uh, some of the albums. This is a Genesis album, a Led Zeppelin album. Uh, and so you can see here we have the the mythology. We have we, we, you, you see this is this is not uh, uh, an album of Freddie and the Dreamers, where you have Freddie uh, and his Dreamers, and they're stood there with a the guitar. And so it's not very literal at all. It's very very dreamlike, uh, and, uh, uh, and 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 so on and so forth. Emerson, Lake and Palmer. Uh, Emerson, Lake and Palmer. I don't know if I actually have an Emerson, Lake and, and Palmer here. Uh, it, it, it would be it would be. Uh, Great if I did. Emerson, Lake and Palmer. No, it doesn't look like it. Oh well, never mind. Um, have, have a look at, have a listen to this one by uh, Jethro Tull. And make it piece of everyone. But those who choose to stay will live just one more day to do the things they should have done. As you cross the wilderness, a spending in your emptiness, you really have to pray. Looking for a sign that the universal minds has written you into the passion play. skating away on the thin ice of a new day. So we went we, into, uh, uh, with, uh, so artistic and poetic pretensions here. Uh, all very much helped along by this wonderful instrument, which was, uh, uh, became uh, um, affordable in the mid, mid 1970s. And this is a Moog synthesizer, which allows you to do uh, a, a lot more things with uh, different, kinds of, uh, different kinds of sounds. Uh, and so, one of the one of the, uh, the one of the famous examples that we need to need to look at is is Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven. And she's buying the stairway to heaven. When she gets there, she knows if the stars are all closed with a word, she can get. That, that, what you have there, I think, is all, almost all the words, anyway, of a, of a very long piece, eight minutes long. And so that you have a, fa a fairly typ uh, typical uh, uh, example. I'm going to have to rush right ahead here and move on to glam rock. 
so glam rock then again, this is in the 70s. The 70s was a tremendously uh, productive uh, uh, decade and and which le always leads the hi historian to ask the question, why? Because all the interesting questions uh, in history begin, why? And so why did Britain in the 1970s manage to bring forward or accelerate a whole series of genres? And of course, I don't have the final answer, but it certainly seems that the end of the boom and the beginning of the crisis, this changeover, uh, it was a particularly uh, uh, useful place for artists to have new ideas. Everything was changing uh, in the uh, during the 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 boom. Uh, you must remember that when uh, when people were living through, as you say in French, the trente glorieuses, they were not saying, "Ah bah, ben, ça fait vingt-neuf ans des trente glorieuses déjà passé. Il ne reste qu'une année. Hein? Qu'est-ce qu'on va faire?" Not at all. People were convinced that the boom was eternal that mass unemployment was dissipated for, was, was, had dissipated forever um, and that every generation would, would be, be better off than the previous one. And so the terrible shock uh, of, the, uh, uh, of, of, of the crisis. So what did Glamrock do about this? Well, uh, they, uh, uh, it's very much about playing with masculinity and transgressive, um, transgressive what? <laughs> transgressive, uh, and transgression before a, ma before a mass audience. That is that this was very much well-known uh, uh, androgynous uh, makeup and, and clothes of De David Bowie, which today seems extremely banal, but in the 1960s was really, uh, uh, sorry, in the 1970s was really rather rather shocking. That is that uh, in 1967, uh, male homosexuality was no longer criminal, uh, but that didn't mean it was really widely accepted. And so this was a mass uh, uh, playing around with what is masculinity. And so you can have uh, uh, players who were, uh, uh, what sort of st uh, stars who were um, uh, d dressed with uh, uh, platform boots this big, gold coloured, and so on, flamboyant, bright, and theatrical. Uh, and it was all, it was very much about par uh, par uh, partying and getting back to the, th the three minute pop song. Here's an example from Gary Glitter. And uh, I, I mean, I can only play you one or two uh, songs. And of course, all glam rock is not, not the same. Each group had its own particular mix of um, personality, music, uh, music and voice. Uh, but as, as a general current, uh, I, I think it's important not to use the word movement, which makes it sound much more organized. What was it rebelling against? It was no doubt rebelling against this progressive rock with their very, very long guitar series, uh, guitar, um, uh, solos, these progressive rockers who take themselves so seriously and they think they are poets and philosophers, aren't they ridiculous? Let's get back to something circus-like, uh, fun, theatrical, uh, and although of course very, very much exaggerated. And you can see that the uh, that the the uh, the um, the clothes they wore could be uh, quite something. Um, and now again, I need I need to point out that you know that that uh, I'm old and you're young. But uh, this was the 1970s. Older people really didn't like this stuff. They they, they thought it was uh, of course the, the the entire society was far more homophobic than today anyway. Uh, but you can see that that the uh, the, the uh, glam rockers in any case uh, really like to play with um, theatrical transgression. Uh, that's Wizard up at the top uh, and sweet. Interestingly enough, Wizard produced a, a, a song called uh, I Wish It Could Be Christmas Every Day, uh, which has become a classic, a classic in the sense that it is played every Christmas. Uh, and that's quite interesting because if, you, if you're a pop group in a particular genre like glam rock, you're probably going to mostly disappear. 
10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later, a very, very small number will survive. However, if you can get a Christmas song that can really help you survive a, a, a little longer. There's the classic picture of, uh, of, of David Bowie. Uh, as I say at the time, this was transgressive. Uh, it's probably not so much, any, uh, not so much uh, anymore. Uh, now, interestingly enough, uh, uh, every now and then a group will begin uh, within a genre, but go much further. And Queen began as glam rock, uh, but became something much bigger uh, and much, uh, much more well known with Freddie Mercury and so on uh, in the following years. So let's move right on and have a look at heavy metal now again. I'm only going to give you a few minutes about uh, heavy metal. Uh, and see uh, what were its priorities and values. Well, certainly very much a reaction against uh, uh, hippie culture. And one of the, uh, there was an interview with uh, Black Sabbath, who were one of the uh, uh, best known of the heavy, heavy metal uh, bands. And, uh, uh, and the, the player really said, you know, we lived in Birmingham, in industrial Birmingham. We walked past the factories every day. We were not going to California with flowers in our hair. That is to say, he claimed at least that the 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 most popular music of the time, yeah, the, from Woodstock uh, and so on, singing about you know peace and love and going to California, you know, uh, 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 did not did not feel to him to correspond to be an aesthetic which could correspond with the lives of the people around him and, and in particular working class people, uh, and so uh, they produced the, some of the first uh, 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 heavy metal um, and. Um, uh, here's one of the well-known Black Sabbath uh, pieces called uh, Electric Funeral. <laughs> So extreme instrumental use, extreme voices, and this will become one of the hallmarks of heavy metal with, uh, with the introduction of screaming voices and so on. Uh, and finally, um, transgressive themes, satanic and dark themes, which is very interesting, very, <coughs> I mean, of course, Black Sabbath um, is suggesting of, of uh, Satanism. And there's another very well-known group, uh, Judas Priest, Le Prêtre Judas. Uh, so obviously with this sort of reversed Christian sort of satanic um, thing. Now, um, Satan, they weren't really Satanists and Satanism wasn't really that transgressive anymore in the 1970s, uh, but uh, attacking the church and attacking organized religion was a, it seems to me, a fairly easy target because uh, organized religion was declining anyway. Uh, and so, uh, and it was not, it was not political to attack. Uh, religion and to to play around with uh, satanic things. So in some ways, it was a way of being rebellious without being um, without being religious. Sorry, rebellious without being political. And I have one more here: that the extreme th that themes, satanic themes, and dark themes. And this one is an interesting one by Judas Priest. It's called "Screaming for Vengeance." Yeah, je hurle pour la vengeance. So I think it's fair enough to say that that is not uh, something that you do on a Saturday night to have fun. What are you doing on Saturday? Oh, sorry, I'm busy. I'm screaming for vengeance. You know, yeah, I haven't done it for a while. Um, so let's see. So it's very interesting that it should become a pop music so uh, theme. Yeah, screaming for vengeance. Uh, and it, it, it's uh, not very precise what he's screaming about, but obviously some sort of uh, cry of anger against the world that wants to control us, which, uh, which is uh, something which uh, artists throughout the last couple of centuries have often liked to rail against. Judas Priest screaming for vengeance. <laughs> Uh, 
uh, interestingly, also something about the volume, and obviously I can't play it at, uh, at real volume. Uh, at the time, the, the, the 1970s, it's a time when amplification got much more powerful. So it's possible to listen to music much louder. Uh, however, what appeared to be loud at the time uh, is not, no longer loud today because it's continued to go up uh, to some extent, and to which to, to such an extent that it's not unusual for people to go to concerts today with earplugs, um, which uh, seems very strange to old people like myself. So I have here, yes, then, then a series of uh, um, uh, heavy metal covers, a Deep Purple, Iron Maiden. And so you can see that it's, it's not uh, partying on a Saturday night and it's not love and peace and harmony and uh, my philosophical vision of the universe. Uh, however, it could last for quite a while. And here you have Judas Priest at the top in, uh, in uh, the 1970s and underneath as they are today, because to everybody's surprise, a whole series of these mega groups from the 1970s just continued and continued. And you can see uh, Judas Price, Priest in concert today, and it's mostly the same people, although not all of them. Although for, for the age they are, they're looking quite cool. So here you have actually the words of screaming for vengeance, yes, and so so you can see this idea uh, of uh, a dystopian world where you're being controlled by the government, etc. We're screaming, the world is a manacled place, the world is defiled in disgrace, uh, and you can see that uh, the the future does not appear to be rosy. Then you're pushed and shoved into every corner. Then you lead you out into the final slaughter. Yes, so no 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 fun no fun there. Uh, this has been uh, studied. Yeah, there's, there's been uh, uh, there is these days there is a whole uh, um, set of university people who study heavy metal, uh, and here you have a couple of uh, uh, a couple of books from the Metalheads: Heavy Metal Music and Adolescent Alienation, uh, and this one: Heavy Metal, Gender and Sexuality. And so you have uh, everything you need there. Uh, and Metal Studies Conference. That's a university conference, uh, a, a conference on metal. Uh, on metal and history. So there's always something to be studied there. Uh, now, uh, just a reminder before I go back to the genders that uh, uh, m much of uh, 1970s music did not necessarily go into genders and Top of the Pops was uh, the uh, uh, place of uh, a large number of a large number of one hit wonders that is to say groups who just had one successful record meanwhile the old gray whistle test which you can find some episodes of you can find episodes of top, top of the pops on youtube it's very interesting uh, and you can find episodes from the old gray whistle test the old gray whistle test was the program that took uh, popular music seriously uh, and talked about albums and allowed people to play for 20 minutes and not just for free uh, also the publications were important, always important to uh, the history of popular music because they allowed uh, fans to react and commentators to react. Melody Maker uh, is the most important one, and NME uh, is the is the other one. New Musical Express. So, uh, just a, a couple more. Let's have a look at punk rock, which is very much talked about. I mean, everybody knows the slogan "punk is not dead." Uh, now, uh, it was considered to be very new in one point, from one point of view, but. In some ways, it continued the tradition of glam rock because it was theatrical and transgressive. Very theatrical, you know, with the hair up here and uh, uh, and being rude, uh, being rude. Uh, famously, the Sex Pistols went on television and used some very rude words, and it was a national scandal. This was still the 1970s, remember? But what are, there are a number of things which are particularly new uh, in punk rock, and the first one is the aesthetic of the loser. Uh, which is uh, absolutely fascinating because the, the typical narrator in a rock and roll song is a young man who's very successful with the ladies. And the typical narrator in a progressive rock song is a philosopher poet. And the typical narrator in a heavy metal song is a uh, uh, masculine uh, transgressive person. But the typical narrator in punk is the loser, not the winner. It's not always been the winner. Uh, and so the aesthetic of loser, this allowed uh, songs which had a much... Uh, more varied uh, impact on impact on their on on their on their audience. Uh, the famously, then the Sex Pistols uh, song, yeah, um, we're so pretty, oh so pretty, vacant, and we don't care. Who's having like dead videos on? Uh, which was taking the criticisms, the perceived criticisms of an older generation. Oh yes, young people, they they have nothing in their heads, 
uh, saying, yeah, we have nothing in our heads so we don't care, uh, was something very interesting, uh, new way. Uh, the other thing is that the, the punk rock introduced for the first time, in my opinion, sarcasm into pop songs. Uh, there's a sarcasm, yeah, yeah, God save the queen, we mean it, man, we love our queen. Uh, and so, yes, and so it had a certain number of, it seemed to uh, uh, open up new possibilities for, for rock music, although uh, musically, uh, the, um, the songs are not innovative, it's not a new kind of music, it's just rock and roll played faster with more sarcasm and, and, uh, and a rougher voice. Uh, very short songs, uh, they, they are fast from the beginning to the end. There's something very interesting, it's not like many pop songs which begin slow and then go fast and then slow. But punk rock is from the beginning to the end. It, it's it, uh, it's fast in ge in general. So what were they rebelling against? Well, they, this is 1976 in Britain, most of 1977, and they were rebelling against a whole series of previous sorts of popular music. And I already pointed out that quite often, uh, musical genres in popular music reb rebel against previous genres of popular music even more than they rebel against anything that's going on in society. And so certainly punk, punk rock was rebelling against the positive party attitude of disco music, the musical pretensions of progressive rock and the macho posturing of rock and roll. Uh, and finally, the other thing about punk is that uh, this was really a do-it-yourself uh, fashion, if you like, um, that thousands and thousands and thousands of people formed their own little punk rock group in their garage with drums and electric electric guitar um and so this was the first time really that this happened since skiffle skiffle uh, in the uh, 19 uh, late 1950s uh, was uh, a do-it-yourself movement where every you know, make your own band don't just listen to us make your own band so what do we what do we have here to show you well, this is the anarchy in the uk uh, this is the sex pistols the lights In fact, the Sex Pistols, of course, were not anarchists. It's just that anarchy was the word that they thought uh, would most shock uh, the establishment. They were probably right about that. Uh, occasionally, songs would get a little bit more uh, po political. This is Stiff Little Fingers uh, uh, talking about Northern Ireland, uh, an alternative Ulster, uh, that we, we need a new kind of society in Northern Ireland. <laughs> Now, there are many hundreds, several hundred uh, punk groups. I certainly can't uh, give, give you an idea, but it did seem to open up uh, possibilities for uh, new kinds of music and new kinds of, 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 uh, of um, thinking as well. This is Gang of Four. So this very rapidly punk became post-punk just a few months later. Sorry, just a few years later. And this is Gang of Four uh, singing a very interesting song called Anthrax. Love will get you like a dose of anthrax.
uh, here are a couple of the a couple of the fanzines, which one of the characteristics of uh, punk music that punk uh, 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 suggested not only um, that everybody should form their own band or at least all young men because it was it was very much about men. Um, although women came to do it as well, which was pretty good. Uh, but also make your own magazine, be something that from the ground up. Uh, so very much uh, that's grassroots kind of aesthetic. Uh, a couple of the uh, a couple of the best known. Uh, um, albums. Uh, one of the things I liked about, uh, about this album is that many, many years later, um, they reformed to have a, uh, uh, um, a an international tour and a new album. Uh, and the journalist said, "Well, you know, tell us why. Why did you reform your group?" Uh, these are musical journalists uh, used, uh, expecting some very philosophical answer. And the Sex Pistols said, oh, "We did it for money," uh, and they actually named their tour "Filthy Lucre," uh, which is "Filthy Profit." Dirty profit. Uh, so I, I thought that had a certain that, that had a certain that had a certain something uh, to it. Uh, and here here are some of the uh, some of the big names. You have the undertones, very much loser about being a loser. There's a, they have a, a, a great song about uh, having a cousin who's better at everything than they are. So it's, it's got something in there. The Buzzcocks. Uh, uh, now they opened up. They they they, they produced uh, songs about uh, uh, masturbation and about uh, uh, feeling lonely uh, and all sorts of things that you know pop songs were not necessarily supposed to talk about. Stiff Little Fingers then from uh, Northern Ireland. Who's that? Well, the Stranglers. Yes, the 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 the, 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 the Stranglers. Now there you go. What else do we have here? Uh, yeah, that the, uh, I think I mentioned to you that uh, women would would form women's groups and and find a little bit of space for themselves. And uh, uh, well, I, I have I have a, a little song here from from the Slits, and this is called "Typical Girls." And so it's an anti-sexist song. So it says, you know, "Typical girls like makeup. Typical girls read magazines, and so on." <laughs> So typical girls stand by their man. Typical girls are emotional. So quite a creative uh, uh, takedown of the very restricted roles that women are supposed to uh, are supposed to be satisfied with um, in, uh, in 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 today's society. So I'll be with you in a moment. Slightly later, essential logic. Uh, another woman woman's group. I think they may have one man in. Uh, and uh, occasionally, then uh, much much more political uh, groups like Crass, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't necessarily have any Crass, um, but uh, uh, who would uh, uh, try to these were, these were actually anarchists, um, and they 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 sang, for example, this song called "Do They Owe Us a Living," uh, because one of the uh, complaints of uh, of conservatives at the time is that oh, young people today they think that. Uh, they think that the world owes them a living, yeah, that, that the world owe, owes them something. Uh, and so Crass wrote this to say, yes, yeah, that's right. The world does owe us something uh, because you've, you, have produ you have created a system which is so horrible. <laughs> In fact, the, the words that you have are of another song uh, in, in front of uh, in, 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 in front of you there. Uh, yes, yeah, so Crass, who were uh, no doubt the uh, the more radical one, they did some uh, uh, quite interesting things. For example, they were always worried about uh, record shops making too much money 
from their uh, albums. I, uh, if I remember correctly, the, the title of one of their albums was Steal This Album. Uh, I think that's correct. I think I'm remembering that correctly, although, you know, at my age. Uh, but even even though even 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 Crass can later become this is much 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 later thirty years later become uh, the subject of an an art exhibition because uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, classic uh, movements within sorry one of the classic um, processes within rock and roll that think is that things begin as transgressive and rebellious and then they make money or the establishment comes to like them but somehow they get integrated into something as a cultural establishment, if you like. And so another genre comes along to be more rebellious. And we will see this later with rap. Now, I, I've, so I've been talking today about uh, musical genres, um, glam rock, um, heavy metal, punk rock, um, to give you examples of how uh, musical genres work. Later musical genres, Bangra, uh, or earlier ones, reggae, or rap, or drum and bass, and so on. Uh, they, they're all different, and, and most of them are very interesting to study, uh, but I just want to give you some examples. Okay, now don't forget to have a look at the, um, the uh, what, what I've put, what I've, what I've put on, on my blog, uh, because uh, uh, there's a lot more. I'm going to put up some links to uh, some YouTube videos, which will uh, illustrate um, some, of, some, of, some of these things. Um, in particular, there's a series of uh, um, television programs called Britannia, uh, which you don't have to uh, look at, but you can. That's the address of the blog there. There's a lot more uh, things on there. So thank you very much for listening, and uh, I will see some of you, no doubt, next year.